Good morning. Aren't you glad you're here? If you wonder what I'm doing, I'm setting my timer. If you wonder what effect that has, very little. But <laughs> uh, today is Vision Sunday, and today is the one Sunday a year where we share a lot of information with you because there are things that we think you have a right to know. And so this morning, we're going to be talking about quite a few things. I'd like to start with this question, and the question is, why are you here? And not just this specific Sunday, but why do we come together week after week to this facility? Why do we participate in worship? Why do we listen to the teaching and preaching of God's Word? Why do we gather? And if we don't know the why, then the what won't make a lot of sense to us. So today, you're going to hear a lot about the what is happening around here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the why. On my desk, I looked at it again this morning, there's a letter that I received from our denomination back in 1998. I know some of you weren't born yet, but uh, 1998, and uh, it was telling us that because we had less than 20 members, uh, we were at risk of losing our affiliation, and uh, we were put on probation. So a lot has happened in 26 years. But more than that, a lot has happened in the last year, and we'd like to share some of those things this morning. Let me tell you what I'm most worried about today, though. And what I'm most worried about today is that this conversation will sound like we're bragging about us. And that's not how we feel at all. We do not feel special. We feel grateful. And I think that there's a kind of humility required in just being able to say thank you to God for the things that he is doing. And every single church in our community can do this. Every church has things that God has done in the last year and has blessed them with. And I think it's appropriate for us just to take a moment and be able to say thank you for that. So we gather every week because we actually believe that God's grace is the most transformative influence that we have in our lives. It's more, uh, it's more transformative than the family we were raised in, than the education we received, than our ethnicity, than the zip code we live in, than the, the, the income statements that we get. More than anything else, the, the grace of God is transforming our lives. And we are convinced that people are interested, that people are interested in hearing about God's word. And I know there are lots of people who say, People in our culture just aren't interested in Scripture any longer, and that has not been our experience. We have seen genuine spiritual hunger at every age. You might be surprised to know that I was surprised to know this. So if you're over 55, there's a certain percentage of people that attend our church that are over 55. That same percentage applies to people who are parents of families. That same percentage applies to young adults. That same percentage applies to students. The only percentage that's higher than all of those is kids. We have a boatload of kids. How many have noticed that around here? Yeah. We have a lot of kids around here. And what I've noticed is that people don't come to worship out of some sense of obligation. Let's get this out of the way. They come because they sense that, that there are gifts that God has available for them every time we gather, and we don't want to miss them. Now, one of the things I'm going to be using today is this booklet that was put on your seat. It, it contains a lot of information, and we're going to go through some of it today. So I'm going to start on page 7. And what you'll notice is that we had one of the largest increases in attendance in a single year in our church's history. For 26 years, we have not grown by a lot. For 26 years, we've grown a little every year. And uh, this last year uh, was, was quite a jump in that. So how did this happen? And I can actually tell you, last year, we made it our theme to be involved in conversations with people who are not yet connected with God and when appropriate to extend invitations to join us. And the result is, is because you have lived out your faith over the last year, we actually saw a 34% increase in our average Sunday attendance. That's a lot. In case you're wondering, that's also a lot of donuts. 
and, uh, and a lot of bagels and a lot of coffee. We, the question we get asked every year, so how many donuts and bagels to go, do you go through on a Sunday? And the answer right now, on average, there's some Sundays that we have to order more because they're, they're higher attendance Sundays, but on average, 37 dozen donuts and 17 dozen bagels. Which means roughly about 40% of you are, are, are not eating a donut or a bagel, so I don't know what you're doing, but. Um, in our attendance numbers, we actually did not include uh, the data from our, our Christmas Eve Sunday because that, that service was really high and attendance much higher than usual and we didn't want to make it look as though we had on average more people attending than that. Uh, roughly about 102 people last year made a commitment to Christ that we know of. 32 people decided to follow the Lord in baptism and uh, next Sunday and the Sunday following, you're going to see even more people do that. 52 people decided that they wanted to become members of our church family. 22 children were dedicated to the Lord. 150 people joined us for pretzels with the pastors. If you don't know what that is, if you're new to our church family, once a month we gather in the conference room and we have some fresh, warm pretzels and we just introduce people who are new here to our pastoral staff and let them know some of the things that are happening in case they want to participate. How did all this happen? You are living out your faith. You don't believe that church is just for certain people. You believe it's for anyone, for everyone. We haven't done any fancy marketing. We, we're not cutting edge, none of that. What we are is we just keep showing up and sharing what God is doing and how many are grateful. God is still doing a lot of very good stuff in our lives, yeah? So, um, we don't believe that our value in life is actually determined by what we acquire. You're not worth more because you have more. Our value is actually established by what God thinks of us and what God has done for us. And he sent his one and only son to die on a cross for us. And so we've come to understand and we're learning to live out that value. But we also want other people to feel valued too. So if you're looking at page nine, this is an unbelievable number. 575 people are signed up for regular volunteering assignments on an, on an ongoing basis at Calvary Assembly. I, I don't think you heard me. <laughs> 575 people are signed up to volunteer and serve other people at our church. Uh, that's phenomenal. They're showing up, they're using their skills, they're using their abilities to serve others. Every single Sunday, it takes a minimum of 120 people to pull off ministry on this campus and online. And, and if you added up all the hours of our volunteers for the year, it would come to over 20,000 volunteer hours. If we were paying minimum wage, it would be over a $306,000. And how many think our volunteers are way worth more than minimum wage? Yeah, worth, way worth more. Um, just the hospitality team. You should see them in here early, getting the coffee going and putting the donuts on plates. And I was talking to somebody this morning, and they said, I love doing this. And I said, well, there are people who love that you do this. And, and when, when we just left, children were running to their classes where they're going to be greeted by volunteers who are teachers and helpers who are just as excited to have them in the classroom as the kids are to be there. People help out with our communion. They help out with, with music. They help out with greeting. They, they teach. They, they do all kinds of things around here, and we are so grateful for them. In fact, can we just tell all our volunteers this morning how much we appreciate all the work they do every single Sunday, every single one. I'm on page 10 now, and this is where we talk about our global partners. We have 36 global ministries that we support because we think that grace of God shouldn't be limited to a certain region of the world or to a certain ethnicity group or a certain education level or a certain income status, that there should not be a barrier between God and anyone in the entire world. And so we make sure 
And I can tell you right now, there are places that we support that because of your support, there are children who will go to bed in a safe bed tonight and they had healthy food today and they are getting a great education and their future, their future will be able to live out the promise of God in their life instead of being on the receiving end of perversions of other people in our world. How many are grateful that there are children who are safe in the world tonight and it's because of things that you have done? Yeah. College students, uh, we, we have some people in our, our, our deaf community uh, who, who they, they lead a campus ministry at RIT because as you know, there's a large deaf uh, uh, contingency at RIT and they believe that college students whose primary language is ASL, they should also not be excluded from the grace of God. Uh, one, of our, one of the weird partners, when you look through that list, uh, it says the Garrison Retirement Fund. And, and, and you might be wondering, why are we supporting a retirement fund? And, and is that for pastor or is that for someone else on staff or, or is it for some guy named Garrison? <laughs> and the answer is no to all of those. This is not for anyone in house. There are ministers who have given their entire lives to the gospel, but they have nothing left. And so we think that they're worthy of support for what they have already done. And so part of our income every single month goes out to help make sure that they have a place to stay too. Um, there was a, a couple in our church who had an amazing idea a little over a year ago. I met with them and they had this idea that maybe we could um, partner together as a church family to help uh, families who are struggling to close the gap financially on adoption. If you don't know, in the state of New York, the average cost of adoption is between $30,000 and $50,000. And uh, the, the, the parents don't get that and the kids don't get that. It's, it's a complicated process. And so, uh, so we started raising money and, uh, and it, it's absolutely uh, phenomenal. Just before Christmas, we helped a couple see their dream become a reality. And uh, I'll actually let you tell their story if you can just watch the video for a second. Hello, I'm Jess. And I'm Johnny. And this little bundle of God's grace is Larcy Joy. And we are the Carters. Y'all, our journey for the last nine years of infertility <laughs> was the most trying times of our lives. It was also the most humbling, faith building, and spiritual growing as well. Coming to the end of ourselves and giving up control of this situation was the greatest choice we ever made. After doing after doing and trying all the things, <laughs> we realized that God was the only one who could give us a child. Not doctors. We prayed and cried and prayed and cried some more, but this time we lived it through faith. We felt God directing us to adoption. We had no idea or what, but we knew that it was God's plan for us. After doing all of the home studies and everything that we needed for the adoption, we shortly after that, we got a call. A birth mom chose us. Because it was three months away from um, delivery, the cost was estimated at $52,000. Yes, y'all. <laughs> 52. $52,000. I wanted to panic, but I couldn't because during the first call, I heard God tell me that this was our baby girl. So I had no fear because I knew God was going to come through. And did he ever? Yes, he did. <laughs> yes. Although we thought those nine years were going to break us, we learned that God's word holds true no matter the circumstances. He is faithful and his ways are better than ours. He is on time. Every time, y'all, God is good. We are so thankful for you, Calvary family, for helping us bring our baby girl home and blessing us in more ways than one. Yes, y'all are a life changer. <laughs> we, we are very grateful. <laughs> Um, I was able to call them and tell them that we were, we were closing the gap on what they had raised and what they still needed and that we will be uh, taking care of that. She did not have time to walk across the room before the phone rang and the baby came one month early. And they wanted to know if they would be able to, to meet that financial request uh, requirement in, in order to be able to bring that baby home. <laughs> and she could say, absolutely. And how many are grateful? There's a wonderful family being built today. Yeah. <clears throat> I talked with another family this last week. And uh, on their third date, 
they talked about adopting, not because they wouldn't be able to have children, as far as they knew, but they just thought that was a good thing to do. And so they have a son of their own, but they are also planning on adopting, and so that could well be our next project. I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful that these kinds of things can happen in our world today. Um, you give of your resources very generously. So the question is, uh, why do we give our resources away? And the answer is because we think we're supposed to be generous. Uh, you wouldn't have seen it. Most people would not have been part of our church family at this point. But quite a few years ago, the church council and I drove out on a day in February, a Sunday, and we parked across, that, where's Tom Infantino? There you are, he was there. We stood knee deep in snow on this property and we asked God to give it to us. And that if he did, we would make him proud with it and we would be generous with it. We tried to live up to that. Last year, we gave away over $173,000 to help people who were in need and to uh, ministries that we supported. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of financial information. You will find that on page five. Thank you. Five and six. Yes, page five and six. But here's a, a financial video that'll bring you up to speed on that. Church, I want to express a heartfelt thank you to everybody that's a part of our community. You've been just crazy generous and it's fueled an amazing year of ministry. It's, you're helping us reach even more people and making a significant impact on people's faith. Being accountable and transparent with our resources is super important. So let's take a closer look at our financial overview, starting with our different sources of income. You can see here the incredible generosity of our church. It's our first full year with our adoption fund, our benevolence, our global partners around the world, our building, our interest went way up this year. We've got our facility fees, gifts for our pastoral team, and our tithes and offerings. Your support for missions helped us reach over 20 different countries, spreading the gospel across the globe. Notably, our tithes and offerings saw a huge increase with 10.6% up from 2022. Holy cow, we, we're just, we're grateful for God's faithfulness in this growth. Turning to our expenditures, great ministry, as you know, it requires financial resources and your generosity enables us to serve our community effectively. Investments were made in our worship space, office supplies for helping spread the word, and our incredible staff of 23 individuals who lead and disciple our church. Significant increases were made in various ministries, but particularly our benevolence and our outreach ministries. This allowed us to show uh, support to initiatives such as aiding young girls at risk of being trafficked, assisting refugees, serving the homeless, and providing support to schools in Churchville and inner city Rochester. We also gave more than four times to missionaries as we brought in and designated funds. Furthermore, we made strides in reducing our mortgage debt by over $346,000. $210,000 of that money was contributed on top of our normal mortgage payments to help us pay down that debt even faster. Now, what's true about our church is we don't just have like one or two huge donors that carry most of the giving. For example, last year we had over 250 new givers. Their first time giving at our church. I love that more and more people are playing an active part in the mission of helping us reach and disciple people with the gospel. And what's great about this is our kids and our, our teens, they're jumping in on the giving too, which is exciting to think about them creating habits of generosity that can carry them into their adult years. Now I could share a countless stories of how God has used the resources entrusted to us. What I want you to understand above all else is that your investment, it's actually transforming people's hearts and minds. Like there is a direct correlation happening here. And, and we had multiple times this last year where so many people wanted to be baptized that we had to add in another week of baptisms for people to go public with their faith. And in fact, not just that, it's still happening this year. Next week, we're gonna celebrate baptisms and that all filled up, so we gotta add another date. I just, I, I love this stuff because life change just never gets old. So 
On behalf of all of our church's leadership, I just want to say thank you. Your generosity matters, and it's it's impacting people in Rochester, Chi Lai, and across the globe. And we want you to know that if you have absolutely any questions, please come and ask. And let me just say this one more time. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, you might be saying $2 million, that's a lot of money. How many think that's a lot of money? Not as many as I thought. <laughs> uh, so when you talk about amounts like that, there are people who wonder about staff compensation, and, and we understand that. Roughly 40% of what came into general fund was used in staff comp compensation, and that's uh, 23 people on our team. Um, we don't disclose individual staff salaries, as I imagine you would prefer that your uh, individual staff sal or your individual salary would not be disclosed to others. But there's one exception to that rule, and so if after the service today you want to know what I make, I keep my W-2 right on this little uh, uh, desk uh, next to my chair, and anyone is welcome to uh, come by and take a look at that. Uh, I ask that you not take a picture of it and post it anywhere. And I ask, uh, I also did block out my, my uh, uh, social security number and my home address because I would prefer that this didn't become an identity theft situation. <laughs> but, uh, but that is available for you to see. And I always tell everybody every year this, if you think that uh, I make too much, keep it to yourself. <laughs> if, if you think, no, no, that's not how it is. I said it backwards. <laughs> uh, well, I screwed that up. <clears throat> if you think I make too little to keep it to yourself, if you think I make too much, uh, you can talk to counsel about that. All right. He said, he, he, the pastor told us, if we think he makes too much, just keep it to yourself. Yeah. Um, our, our church, when we built this addition, uh, we... We raised $1.1 million. We'd already saved a half a million dollars, and then we took out of our reserves additional money to, for a total of $1.8 million cash infusion, and we borrowed $2.56 million, which makes our entire project $4.36 million, which is a lot of money, too. And what I'm very happy to uh, tell you is that we have paid down since we moved into this space over a million dollars on our principal. So we borrowed 2.56, but we just owe a little over 1.5 left on our primary mortgage. How many think that's a good thing? Yeah. Um, we actually plan on having our mortgage uh, completely paid off uh, in, within the next six years. And in case you're wondering about our interest rate, we locked in at 2.775, so. Yeah, <laughs> no. Um, we're actually building reserves in our accounts right now, and it's not just to have more. It's by God's grace, our hope is that in the near future we'll be able to plant a church or open a second campus. And what you need to know is that none of this is about making a name for ourselves. It's about helping people connect to Christ wherever they are. And so you can keep that in prayer. Uh, we know that most people will not just show up on Sunday, and so we invest into a digital option for people to check us out first, and a lot of, a lot of people do. A lot of what happens here actually happens outside of these walls, and I'm on page 13 and 14 if you're looking at that, but 80 families this year were provided, or last year were provided with a Thanksgiving dinner. 129 children were given Christmas presents that wouldn't have had them otherwise. 80 backpacks were given away to kids as they headed off to school. 91 local needs through the foster care and social work programs in our, um, in our uh, community was met. 34 of you actually served at a local school as volunteers to help children with literacy. 40 of you served in a homeless shelter this last year. And when I say served, that doesn't mean that they served just one time. There are 40 of you that regularly serve in a homeless shelter, and there are 80 of you that showed up for Hope Day, where we had projects where we try to help other people and other organizations in our community, and we buy the materials, and we supply the volunteer labor, and they go out and they spend an entire day and make a difference in someone else's life. We have two refugee support groups, because people who are coming from far away and have nothing, most of what they owned has been taken from them. We want them to feel welcome. In fact, I'm having an ongoing conversation with a refugee pastor right now. Uh, we're not, we are not a church if the church is only inside these walls. 
If all we're doing is what happens in here on a Sunday, we're not a church. I don't know what that is. I don't want to find out. I don't know. I'm on pages 15 and 16, 278 of you participated in small groups this last year. We had 22 groups because you're finding out that it's not just about participating in a service, but it's becoming part of a community. Pages 17 and 18, we had, 100, we had 160 kids show up every single week, every single week, to be taught about God's grace in their lives. 98 of them were on this stage for the Christmas play. <laughs> if you were there for that, 172 participated in Adventure Camp. And that does not include our middle school and high school age kids. There's information in your booklet about that too. Young adults gathered to build community and to build their faith. They averaged 55 uh, in their uh, small groups and 45 at events. Uh, young at heart, which is our, our 55 and, and older uh, group. They meet once a month on Thursdays, and it's one of our, our staff's favorite days because they, they invite them to participate in lunch, so our staff is well-fed on Thursdays, so we're grateful for that. Last Thursday, last Thursday, we got a call from a local business because they know a little bit about our church, and they told us that there was a homeless family that was living in a laundromat in a nearby plaza. And so uh, John, who's in charge of outreach ministry, went over to check it out. He was able to provide them some food. He was also able to provide them a gift card at Wegmans to help with some additional food and some transportation so that they could get some documents that they needed. But he also invited them, since it was Thursday, to come over for lunch because the young at heart were here. And without saying anything about them, the Young and Heart members reached out to them. And when the, the lunch was over, they went over, they started talking to them. They wound up giving out of their own pockets some resources towards them. And they packed up all the leftovers and gave that to them. How many are grateful? There is no age. You can't be useful in the kingdom of God. It's just true, right? Uh, page 21, our worship team leads us into God's presence every single week. Um, there's special nights, uh, currents, and, and uh, uh, where people, we just had one this last week, where people gather for an extended time of worship. You might not know, but last year our worship team actually recorded an album of original music, which you get to hear here on Sundays fairly regularly. But uh, they've already released two of those as singles, and the album will be coming out this year so that you can listen to our worship team anytime you want, which I think is a pretty cool idea. Yeah. So what's left to do? A lot. Our communities are still filled with people who can't dare to believe that life could get any better for them. They carry very heavy burdens, their dreams are fading, and their struggles are many. They just don't know yet how close God is or how much God cares. And as long as there's anyone who doesn't know that, we have a job to do. Our theme this year is thrive. And let me tell you what that does not mean. When we talk about our church family thriving, it does not mean we just have more attendance and more income. Our church has never been focused on a growth goal. We've never tried to hit a certain number in attendance in, in 26 years. That's never happened. Our focus has tried to be on health. I've got two granddaughters and they're both thriving. One is six years and one is six, well, about to be six years, and one is six months. And uh, what we've discovered is if they have a safe place to be raised, if they have adequate nutrition, adequate rest, adequate exercise, growth is a natural by byproduct. And so we tried to create spiritual nutrition and spiritual rest and, and spiritual exercise, ways for people can come together in a safe environment and that that actually makes a difference. So we've never focused on growth. We do focus on health. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up. In Psalm 92, it says this. For those of you who are worried, I wasn't gonna use the scripture today. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, the Lord is upright. He is my rock. 
There's no wickedness in him. I think God wants everyone to thrive at every age. And a good question to ask yourself is, what would it be for me to thrive? In the situation I'm in in life, the age that I am, what, what, is, what is a thriving child look like? What does a thriving student look like? What does a thriving college student, young adult, young family, over 55, grandparents, great-grandparents, what we do know is that people don't thrive in isolation. They struggle if they don't have access to grace and community. And that's why we're here. Not so that our organization grows like a palm tree or a cedar in Lebanon, but that every single person who crosses the threshold of this place or has access to anyone who does will feel like they've started to thrive in their life. So what's the common denominator for thriving? And the psalmist tells us they're planted in the house of the Lord, in the courts of our God. And if we do that, that we can be fresh, we can be flourishing, we can be fruitful at any age of our life. So what do flourishing people declare? That the Lord is upright. You can trust him. And secondly, there is no evil in him. He doesn't have a hidden motive or agenda for our lives. That doesn't mean that everything always goes the way that we want it to. Our world is broken, it is dark, and it is medicating a pain that can be dulled but not eliminated. Fear has become the prevailing language and too many people are fluent in it. We have so much grace work to do. We do. Jesus did not come into our world just so that we could survive it. He wants us to have life to the full, to thrive. And he invites us to invite others and sends us out to them. So the goal of this house is not a facility. The goal of this house is not a bank account. Those are just tools and resources that we use. Our goal is a safe place where people can find out that God is real and you can trust him. It's a safe place where people can discover friendships that aren't just based on what you can get or take. And it's a safe place where you don't just dream about the future, but you can take some bold steps towards it. You are making a difference in the Rochester region and in 20 places around our globe. I'd like us to take a moment just to thank God for including us in that today. Could we do that? Would you all stand? Let's, let's give praise to the one who's included us in his plans.